again with Casper van der Mulen. Did I get it right? He's Good here from Holland. And this is a really special year for you because you are here with your family. Yes. Casper has the cutest little baby. <laughs> I do. Yeah, it's true. Uh, the smallest biohacker, four months old. Yeah. Wandering around here, which is, is really great. So yeah. what did you speak about today? I spoke, I spoke about the relation between uh, breath, conscious breathing, and uh, health span and lifespan. Wow. And what is the connection? Well, it's pretty obvious that if you stop breathing, you die. Sure. <laughs> and what I find interesting is that it's a topic that a lot of people don't take into account when they start optimizing their breath. It's almost like too simple. It's hidden in plain sight. But uh, yeah, you start life on an inhale and you end life on an exhale and in between you're dependent on it for every second of the day. So for me, it's pretty clear if we want to optimize our health, um, it's a good idea to start with the most kind of foundational uh, biological function. And uh, there's a very interesting study that I mentioned that has actually showed, the Framingham study that showed that um, lung volume, lung capacity, the extent to which you can use your lungs optimally uh, is one of the best predictors uh, to predict the length of life. Um, and when we do conscious breathing, this is not what the study showed actually, but when we do conscious breathing, we can improve our lung capacity. And the study didn't really show this because um, in, from a medical perspective, from like an older scientific perspective, there's this idea that lung volume is somehow fixed and that you can improve it. But actually, you can improve it really easily through conscious practice. So that's what the talk was about. What does it mean to consciously breathe? Like well, that's a great question because it's, it's something that, of course, you do on autopilot, like 15 to 20,000 times per day. And you can basically live your whole life without ever doing it on purpose, without ever breathing consciously. But it's a very unique function that we have as, as humans. Uh, most mammals don't have the ability to consciously control their breath. But the fact that we can just go, <laughs> like anything, do with our breath, um, makes it pretty special. And the cool thing about breathing is that it is a function that can be done completely on autopilot, autonomically, through the nervous system, or you can do it completely on purpose. So for me, conscious breathing is about becoming aware of how you breathe, and then questioning, is, is this the right type of breath for what I want to do? For example, if you're sitting on the sofa and you're out of breath, that's a pretty clear sign that, that you're not in the best health. That's not functional. And then to start training to get a more optimal breathing function, not to always have to breathe consciously, but you create little conscious breathing interventions that then kind of reset your natural clock of how you breathe. And then throughout the day, you just get better benefits from your breathing, more oxygen, more energy, without having to think about it. Is there some way that you should consciously breathe or is it individual to each person or where do you get started? Like a few well, months? there's ways that work for everybody. One thing that's a very, like the simplest way to start is to just set a timer uh, for let's say two or three minutes and to just watch your breathing. And then as you're watching it, for example, um, start to make it a little bit smaller or slower than what you're currently breathing. And then for two minutes, you make your breath a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller, becomes a little bit uncomfortable. And then uh, you come back to normal breathing and that's it. And that little bit of difficulty that you feel when you breathe a little bit less, that is basically um, the training stimulus for your body to start using oxygen uh, more effectively. So that's a simple way to start. Or just to, again, to sit and watch how am I breathing and then to notice am I breathing low into my body or am I breathing high up in my body? And then to start practicing to breathe lower and lower into your body and to find more expansion. And so these aren't even technically techniques, right? It's just sitting, watching and making it a little bit smaller or a little bit lower and then you're already breathing better. Is that something you can do like throughout the day, basically? Yeah. Like just constantly watch your breath? Well, the thing is, if you constantly watch it, you, you lose your mind okay. <laughs> because it's supposed to go uh, on autopilot. Um, and the whole point, like I said, of breathing consciously is to have, it, have the autopilot be more effective. But it's a great way to start, for example, is to have three minutes in the morning, and three minutes after lunch and three minutes before dinner and just have like five or six moments when you bring it down a little bit, go a little bit slower, uh, optimize your oxygen levels, basically, and then just go about your day. Interesting. And is the best way to increase lung capacity to hold your breath or is there something else? That is one of the best ways. And the other one of the best ways, it's hard to say which is better, is to um, uh, do breath training with resistance. So there's these really cool devices here uh, um, in the exhibition that help you do that. But my favorite way is to play flute or play saxophone, uh, to, to sing, to sing mantras, uh, to play didgeridoo. So anytime when you 
take a big breath and you're consciously under some kind of pressure, slowly letting your lungs empty again. And uh, yeah, this is something that's really good for lung capacity. So you take a deep breath and then you try to breathe out as slow as you yeah. can. Yeah. What's your like slowest? Like My what? longest exhale. Yeah. It's uh, one minute and 36 seconds. Okay. That's and it's nice. crazy because I once I was just practicing. I wasn't really timing it. And I was like, this is a long time. Let me time it. And then it came out to 136. And it turned out the world record was at 152 at the time that I checked. Wow, and I was so like, I'm going to get this world record. But actually, it turns out that apparently getting those last 10 seconds is, is like running a marathon below, you know, the two hours or something. It's, okay. It was really difficult to wow. get. You mentioned previously about like science used to think that our lung capacity was set. Mm -hmm. I might have my facts a bit wrong, but I heard like the guy who holds the current world record for underwater swimming, he like doubled or tripled everybody in history before him. And now we know that that is Yeah, I don't know possible. the exact facts of that yeah. uh, factoid, but yeah, that's uh, that's that's a thing. And in the freediving world, where they're really, it's a performance sport in, in many cases, it's also a spiritual practice for many people, but it is a way of getting more and more out of it. And it's definitely possible. And I've also seen this in clients that I work with where their lung volume would increase by 20% in, in just like a matter of weeks or months of uh, training. And this is extremely relevant to do because uh, there's more and more pulmonary issues because uh, air quality is going down, lung viruses are spreading, there's more and more plastic in the air. There's all kinds of things, pollutants in the air right now, of which we have no idea what the exact effect is on uh, human lungs. And uh, it's very important to have these techniques uh, for the future of also healthcare to know that there's so much you can do with the body. Is it more about like how you're breathing than the air you're breathing or what's like the main? Well, this is a big, I actually woke up at three in the morning, well, to feed the baby, but also, and I had this sudden thought that I wrote down where it's like in biohacking, we really try to determine what we put into our system. We take away all the toxins and the negative input, the bad food. We um, uh, consciously take in supplements and uh, optimized healthy food um, and because we, we can choose what we put in our mouth. But we can uh, choose what we put in our lungs because wherever you are, you're going to have to breathe the air that's there. Yeah. So since we can't decide what we breathe, we have to start to decide how we breathe in order to have less... Uh, toxic load and for example just switching from uh, for example mouth breathing to nasal breathing this is a huge deal because your your nose is just a genius filter that even has direct immune responses towards pathogens that come in and has well i could talk about the nose for hours but the point is that just switching from mouth breathing to nasal breathing is a massive difference no matter where you live and what the air quality is Okay. I've heard, and I don't know if it's a myth or true, but we're actually supposed to breathe like in and out of our nose and mm -hmm. the mouth is for eating. Is that yeah. a fact or should you breathe out of your mouth? It is a, it is a fact in, a, in many ways, of course. Yeah, but there's, uh, there's no wrong way to breathe, so to say. There's a dysfunctional way to breathe. Function is about are you doing the thing that gets you the result that you want? And in 99% of the, case, the cases, mouth breathing is not functional. Like mouth breathing is functional right now when I'm speaking and everybody understands that it would be very strange if in between sentences I would like pause to take a nose sure. breath because as you're speaking or if you're singing, uh, you're constantly um, modulating the pressure in your breathing apparatus to keep a constant tone, for example. And this is a, a part of being a professional speaker and also singing is that that's a training that I need to do to be very good at mouth breathing in a way that keeps my voice healthy, for example. And during intense workouts or during really heavy emotional states, like when you're angry or when you're sad or when you're in orgasm or like all of the, there's there's a way of breathing that correlates with every state of being. And in the more intense ones, mouth breathing is a perfectly fine thing to do that. We just don't want to want to get stuck in it. We want to be able to come down from the mouth breathing type of states, allow our nervous system to rebalance and come back to nasal breathing. So in 99% of the times, nose is the, is the best way to do Breathe it. Breathe in and out yeah. through your nose. In and out, yeah. This might be obvious for people who are into biohacking, but we've got a very large audience watching online. What are some of the other benefits for breathing? Like that might seem obvious, but people might not know. For example, longevity, of course, but what else is a practical benefit of that? Well, even just like, for example, dental quality, because if you breathe through your mouth and the air is not filtered, then the stuff is going to get stuck in your teeth, you know, and it makes your teeth more yellow. And uh, it can actually decrease the density of the bones, uh, for example, in your teeth, but also throughout your uh, body to breathe dysfunctionally. And... Um, 
some other benefits of uh, conscious breathing practice is, for example, um, having a higher ability to be in your parasympathetic state. Parasympathetic state is where you rest and you recover and digest your food. So you can use a moment of conscious breathing to get your body into the right state for digestion and then your body will digest food better. You could go, um, before you go to bed, for example, a lot of people go to sleep in a stressed state and they say like, oh, my sleep is fine, I, I hit my bed and I'm gone. Um, and But they don't actually sleep in a rested state, they sleep in a stressful state and they wake up through the night for no reason. You know, I have reasons to wake up through the night because I have a baby. <laughs> but... Um, and um, so, for example, just doing three to five minutes of conscious breathing right before you go to sleep and first getting into the right state for sleep and then sleeping can make your sleep much more restful and give you much better recovery. So, um, well, I can go on for hours about that, but it's just these very practical things because nobody cares about breathing. This is a very important. People go, like, why should I focus on breathing? I don't care about breathing. No. Why do you breathe? You breathe to live. So if there's parts of your life that you want to live better, then you can breathe better to live better. And so you can really think about practical situations like resetting your focus in mid of the day, energizing your body in the morning, relaxing in the evening, getting to sleep better, digesting your food. And well, it goes on like that. Very interesting. If you had like one message to give to the world, what would it be? Ooh. In relation to breathing? Or in relation to your legacy? Like what oh, is it um, you? I like to remind people that they're going to die. Life is short, or life is, end, well, short, it's finite. And sitting and meditating on the concept of death and remembering that life will end really brings the intensity of life uh, back into your life. And for me, for example, doing a maximum breath hold, I call a microdose of death. So every day I sit and I hold my breath for as long as I can, and I remind my body, like, hey, this, I remind myself, like, hey, this is, this is going to end, you know? And my body is like, breathe, breathe. And of course, I'm not forcing it too much, but I'm really, like, looking for this physical reminder of this body will end, and what I do in this lifetime matters. And remembering the, sh the, the potential shortness of life intensifies the choices that I make from day to day. Interesting. You probably know the science behind this, but someone told me, like, I, I'm not really a person who meditates very easily and hard to, like, control my thoughts. And someone told me, like, hold your breath and then your body kind of goes into a panic to keep you alive <laughs> and you start thinking. What do you think is, like, going on there? That's great, yeah. But the main thing is there that, that if you hold your breath, so from a physiological perspective, you hold your breath, then you're, you're sending a message to your body, to your brainstem, saying, hey, there's a budget. And then if there's a budget, there's two options. You either increase the budget by breathing again, but you're not doing that because you're consciously holding it, or you limit the expenditure. So metabolism goes down. If you go into a meditation, a lot of people go and sit and they try to calm their mind with their mind. But one way to calm the mind is to let the body go into a lower rate of energy and lower rate of metabolism into a more parasympathetic state. So if you hold your breath, then after that, your body is just going to continue at a much lower rate and your mind is going to be much less active. So it's a great way to start a meditation. One last question. What do you think about the idea of like breathing in and out of your heart? Is there, is there some actual science to that or why does it seem to calm people down? Well, in general, any time that you focus your breath, it's very calming because it, it gives you a, a location to breathe towards. Another thing is, of course, we're talking about this whole physiological aspect of breath now, but a really large part of my work is about the transformative aspect of breath, the emotional, the trauma healing, all these things. So in most people experience their physical sensations and their emotional sensations around their heart. And we think about head and heart. So the cool thing is because breath is the guide of your life, if you focus your breath in a certain place, then you get access to that place, so to say. And if you're stuck in your head and you start breathing into your heart, you're focusing on the location in your body where you experience physical sensations, but also emotion. And this is one of the, one of the ways that it's, you know, in a, it's literally heart opening because of physiological aspects where the heart actually starts pumping more effectively, but also in an, in an emotional sense. And when we breathe, like emotion is energy in motion, as they say. And when we breathe, we have consciously, we have um, an option for bringing emotion into more motion. 
So by focusing on a position in your heart where you feel that, that really works. But there's also practices that focus, for example, on trauma around the pelvic floor or even around, um, around kind of like sexual healing where the breath is directed in, into the pelvic floor, for example. And then, and then you can bring up all kinds of emotions and memories that are stored there and whatever you experience through that part of your body. So it's a way of directing attention and tuning in with those parts of yourself. Very interesting. If people want to learn more about you and your work, where can they find you? What's uh, your- breathworkmasterclass.com this is where our coaches certification is hosted and our online breathing programs and then Instagram at Casper's Focus that's it wonderful thank you very much thank you thanks